Um, okay, so today's date is the 15th of March 2014. My name is Ben Fields, I'm listening to views for the British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project uh, from the Ingai London Institute. Could I begin by asking your name? Yes, my name is Yvonne Foley. And where were you born? In, actually born in Hull. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your family? My family, my present family, my previous oh, my family. Pretty, yeah. Right, well, obviously I have a mother, and she was born in Liverpool, and my genetic father, my Shanghai father, was born in Shanghai, from what I'm aware of. I have a sister from my, with my parent married again, my mother married, remarried, or married again, and I have a sister whose name is Mary, and that's our immediate family my immediate family, my parents and my sister. And so where do you come in that from the order? Pardon? Where do you come in the order of brother and sister? I don't. I only have a sister who's my younger sister. And what, what work did your mother and father do? My mother did a variety of work. Um, during the war, she was a riveter in the aircraft factory, but she mostly worked as a cook and a chef. And worked at the university at one point as a chef, where I believe that's where she met my father. Um, what did your father do? My father, well, my Shanghai father, from what I gather, was an engineer, and he went away to sea. His family were, or I believe, had some business in Shanghai. The person who brought me up, I call my dad, and he worked as a scrapper met metal dealer. What education do you have? Do I have basic education? And then I went on different training courses. When I left school at 15, I went to work in a factory. And then from there, I went to work as a junior clerk in the same company and continued to sort of try and re-educate myself as time went on. So I then did a course with a company who taught me to type and I worked with them for about 18 months. Then after that, that's more or less how I earn my living as a copy typist and administrator. But I've done a variety of work. So that's, that's kind of what you're doing there? I'm retired now. <laughs> um, and would you mind talking a little bit about your personal background and how that's kind of informed what you're doing with that? Well, I didn't start off and half, or I didn't, didn't put up the website until after I'd heard the story. But my background is one of, I worked, and my husband is Charles, and when we married in 1970, we then moved from Liverpool to Birmingham, and then we started doing a lot of travelling because we like travelling. And through Charles's work, we've travelled overseas had the good fortune to live and work in Hong Kong for quite a while at different times and still have association there. Um, and it was then as well that interest, realising this is part of myself. When I came back to England from Australia, which was the last base, I heard a radio programme about sailors being Shanghai or Shanghai sailors and I thought this sounds rather interesting and it could be what happened to my father, who I believe had disappeared. So I then um, started the research with Charles into the story that I'd heard, which is these seamen that have been forced to leave the country. And that's how it started. We picked on the name Half and Half because I'm half English, half Chinese. So we thought it was appropriate. And that's how we came by that name. Now, in terms of a group, it's not a, such a group. What had happened is the person whose programme I'd heard on the radio gave me a list of a few people. I contacted all of them and we got together. And what we decided is what we'd like to do was to put up a memorial plaque to honor both parents, which were our Shanghai fathers and our mothers for what they'd gone through, which is here at the pier head. Um, and we worked towards getting that done. And a number of people realized, you know, wouldn't be able to necessarily trace the family. And I didn't set out to trace my father because I didn't feel that he would be alive, but also I had nothing to actually use as a base to find out whether he was or he wasn't. What was the radio? Um, I think it was. I think it was called Shanghai Sailors. I think it was done by a Look North production team. I think. So was that? I have to wreck my brains. It was on Radio Four. 
BBC. Yeah, so I contacted them and worked through to get to the person that had started it. And from there on in, I wanted to know what the story, what it was about, why it happened. So that's what I set out to do. So it was more or less setting out to find out the truth of these stories that have been going around. Um, that's what I wanted and that's what I feel I've achieved at the moment. And who was the person you originally made contact with, um, with the Harvard Comic group? Well, I got in touch with my childhood friends, as it happened. The gentleman who started the programme, who, who rather had made... From what I gathered, the gentleman who was on the programme, a Mr Coplin, he um, had heard or read a book, or some book talking about the forced repatriation, but I've never been able to find it, and he didn't know what the title was. So I asked him whether or not he'd like me to assist him, and he said yes at first, and then he said no, because he wanted to do it himself, so that was fine. But then a couple of years passed where we had health problems and so on. After that, I then decided I really want to know what's gone on. So because Charles's background is that of an academic, he was able to give me a great deal of assistance, because I'm not, um, but I'm a good gopher, and I'm a good first-caller person. So I started to develop a style to follow through the research. And then what we did, what I did and what Charles did, is every time we found out more information, we put a bulletin together and sent it off to all the different people that I was in touch with. And that's how it started, and that's how it sort of continued still to this day. There's a few of us still meet. There's a lot of them overseas, so I email and keep them up to date in anything that's taking place, i.e. what I'm doing today. And, um, yeah, that's it. Um, and what, so the person who, I've forgotten his name, uh, the person who originally had this programme set up, well, I didn't do anything with, um, with yeah. the what gentleman. Was his, what was his well, his background is he, he was similar, and he originally tried to find his family, and apparently he has, with the help of somebody else. So he's never really got involved then with the aspect of our side of it. I set up the website. We put, Charles and I put up the memorial plaque, and just from there, our small group, we've just kept in touch, and we, I feed the information to them whenever I get it. So that's it. And if we find anybody, it's great. I've managed to put people in touch with each other, which is even nicer. That's all through the website. So, so your involvement really got a group together with the people who are like you together? Eurasians, yes. Yeah, most of us, most of us. Well, all of us are Eurasian, and there's a large community of Eurasians within Liverpool, and the first Chinatown that is referred to is actually Eurasia Town. So going back from First World War, when you had the Chinese seamen that were here then, they were the ones that stayed behind, set up little shops and small businesses, etc., intermarried. And so you had the first group of Eurasians, so it was Eurasia Town. It didn't become a Chinatown that we see as today until the late 50s. And that was when people started coming in from Hong Kong and the New Territories. And they came in as families, sorry. So. Is uh, Eurasian uh, something that you self-identify with? I identify myself as British, but I do know that I am part Chinese. And I was brought up British, the same with the rest of our group. We're all British subjects. We all think and behave as we are, because we didn't... Most of the people that I'm in touch with, we didn't have a great deal of association within the Chinese community. Because, as I said, it was a Eurasia town, so there was lots of marrying out. It was only the late 50s. By then, we were all at school. Most of us had moved out and around the city. So can you explain a little bit about why it would be that the early, um, as you put it, Eurasia town, why, why that was what developed in Liverpool and not anywhere else? You don't maybe see that kind of development? Or, or do you? Um, I think Manchester a bit because a lot of people went to Manchester a lot of the Chinese went to Manchester but they did go later I have to say I think basically because this is a seaport and it was very limited very limited number very limited amount of, of um, Chinese seamen stayed after the First World War again there was a sort of precursor then of, of getting the men to leave forcing the men to leave so there were a very limited number of Chinese men that settled here of course they, they didn't have their women with them because a number of restrictions were placed on women travelling out of China and restrictions on them coming into the country on their own. So they were very few in number. So, of course, human nature being what it is, you've got young men, young women, they get together. Human nature takes its course, and the children start attending the schools in the, I think it was the early 50s, about 52, 53, the first recordings of youngsters 
but the earlier ones, let's say there's a lady within our group whose mother was a Eurasian, so she was from the very early generation. And a lot of, after you've seen the exhibition downstairs, there's a number of the people there that they fathers and like my generation, their grandfathers that were here. So that's how the spread happened. And then you didn't get a lot of settlement. So there were very few in number. And as I said, your only reason that you have it now is because of the change in society and how families came in. But when you don't have families, you don't generate the community in that way. And as most of the children were with their mother, they were brought up in that culture simply because the men went away to sea and they didn't have the facilities to have Chinese schools, etc., etc. So keeping the culture is very difficult in many respects. The men went away to sea. When they came home, they were home for a limited time. Their children, as all the old gentlemen said to me, when I'm going out to work, they're still in bed. When I come home, they're getting ready for bed, they've had the tea. Saturday's the only time you go out shopping with your missus, you get all the shopping in. Sunday, you have a chance to catch up with your friends. So you don't get that gelling and the strength of Chinese communities as exist in the likes of San Francisco, New York, etc. And the reason that you get that difference in San Francisco? San Francisco, because San Francisco, after the Great Earthquake, all of a sudden there were supposedly thousands and thousands of Chinese because all the files had been lost. So people claimed, I was born here, I'm part of the society. So you've got a very large Chinese community, and it still exists today. Um, and the same in, in, you know, elsewhere. But I think it's Holland. There's a, was, used to be a large Chinese community there, but they were kept separate from and separate from them. So, I think it's Holland, yes. I had a research of that. I'd have to go into my files. <laughs> These are questions that I'm putting, my, well, putting myself in an awkward situation to answer some questions. But yes, there were different, different groups so, you know, throughout. And again, mostly the men that travel were seafarers. And so, so is it because of the fact that most of the men were seafarers and they were entering the country as immigrants, um, really what you see is like the creation of like a Eurasian population, second generation, yes. is really because of government policy and Not necessarily, no. I mean, if, if, if you're going to say that, you'd say it was the same at both ends. I mean, you have, men have to work, men provide for their family. So the men took work in, from China, whether it was Guangdong, Shanghai, Ningbo, Fujian, elsewhere, they took the jobs and they were away from home. So you had your family back home. And it, it, talking at my generation, a lot of the men were very young men. There was a few of them that were older and already had families back in China. But they were just young men. So they were young single men. There was lots of young single women. And again, at the time that the men were forced to leave here, what they were going back to wasn't particularly great. So some of them would have chosen to go back and others wouldn't. So general profile of at that time of the 20th century of a, a, sea, a seaman, a Chinese seaman would be young, uh, single perhaps. Well. Yeah, most often, yes. Yeah, most often there'd be young single guys. Some of them would have an education, some of them wouldn't, some of them would engineer. A lot of the, a lot of the guys from Shanghai were mostly uh, educated in engineering and um, the, what we found in the records that most of the Cantonese were laundrymen, firemen, deckhands. And I think that's because of the association with Shanghai of, of the Europeans for so long that you did get a lot of them. A lot of the men from Ningbo as well were in the engineering side. And did uh, those who went into the laundry, did that tend to mean a more permanent settlement? It was a limited number, but presumably, yes, they were going to settle, but they, they had laundries to supply for, the, for their own countrymen. And then it established if they married, then they moved into other areas. So you had families moving out within, within the society. You know, so the, the wife would work alongside the husband. And if the husband still kept a job, then the wife would keep the business going. And it's not a field I'm familiar with, but I do have a friend who's very well up on um, Chinese laundry, so this is his interest. And obviously at the time, the reaction 
reaction the a popular or perhaps even one one of the reactions that you would get at the time of kind of mixing of, of Chinese people and, and, and white girls at the time was kind of I think cer- certainly going before our period it was particularly unpleasant some of the archive material made my the first time ever the expression of sort of making my hair kill that I experienced that, yes, it existed. Um, being a seaport, I grew up with the fact that, you know, there was lots of different nationalities and so it wasn't any particular thing for me to feel that I was standing out or anything else, but I grew up in an area which was mostly sort of immigrant people anyway. Um, yes, it was racist in some of the files. It was, why did these women marry the Chinese? And, the comments were, well, they were handsome, they were clean, they didn't get drunk, and they didn't beat off their wives. So that was a good reason for them to choose to marry the Chinese. It's a particularly sad thing that it does happen. I mean, in my own mother's case, it was, it was like that, in that um, her father didn't agree, and hence why I was born in Hull, because my mother left home. Um, you have to remember in those days that you weren't allowed to get married until you were 21 without your parents' permission. So there was lots of cases in the archives where young women were pregnant or got themselves pregnant and wanted to marry because they, they were in love with the person and their parents wouldn't necessarily give them permission because of the fact it was a mixed-race marriage. Equally, there were as many that did. So, you know, it's, it's very, very mixed. Do you have any um, perception of when those kind of Value those values against what kind of change? Oh, no, I mean, I, I, I remember being called names occasionally, but then again, perhaps it's my nature. I just really didn't particularly like it. And if I got into a disagreement with somebody, then I got into a disagreement with somebody. It was a case that it wasn't that rampant. Or I certainly can't say that I experienced it as being that rampant. And certainly most of my group didn't. And again, because we were all brought up in a very working class society, it was less of a problem, I consider. Um, I think I noticed it more when I was a teenager. But then again, I was sort of, well, okay, it's your problem. If you've got a problem, you've got a problem, not me. You know? um, but that's me, that's my nature. Others did suffer, and again, others suffered it through... They're within their own family, you know, like one of a, a story that I know of one person who when visitors came she was told to go upstairs in her room because she had two other siblings that were from the present sort of husband, so it was quite difficult for some. What, yeah. sort, of, what sort of period was that in? Uh, well we're looking at, I was born in 46, so from then on into perhaps when they were teenagers, up into about the 60s, 70s. I mean, society has changed everywhere, thank God. But um, some places still have problems, you know. And your perception is that because you and it was, uh, you were in the group, um, grew up in working class um, port cities, that actually it was perhaps easier for you? Well, I don't know. I, I... I can't say for somebody else. I can just say for me that my family, I was very lucky. Um, and my family, my friends accepted me as I'm their family, a family member. So I can't say for other people. I just know of stories of other incidences that have taken place. Um, generally, I find that I don't particularly can't recall particularly very unpleasant situations um, and I know certainly from friends of mine that came to settle here years ago, lives in different parts of the UK, they can only recall about two or three occasions and usually the person was drunk of them being racist and generally it's, we're not as racist I don't think as, as, as elsewhere but again somebody else who's perhaps of a different race might feel it differently so I can only go from my own personal experience. And speaking of stories, are there any stories that you can think of that you might have collected uh, from the early Chinatown as it was in Liverpool? In what context? Um, any, I mean, any context. Well, it's different. I mean, the earlier people, uh, there's little anecdotal stuff, but there's some of them where um, they were together as a group 
because they felt more comfortable. They intermarried as a group and they used to hold functions, which was excellent, in a place called the Blackie. They'd have gatherings there so people would get together. And they were a, quite a close-knit community. Um, I wasn't part of the earlier one and I was not really part of the, the later one, simply because once you start marrying out, you go out of the city, you go out into other parts of the city, so you don't have the same association. You meant, did you just mention Black, Black E? Yeah, the Black E, it's a building yeah. that's in Chinatown next to, as you're walking into Nelson Street, it's on the left hand side, the arch is on the right, and the Black E's on the left hand side. So, what you're saying is a, a group would meet there? Yeah, there's, there was a gentleman who's down in the gallery, Mr. Lates and his wife, who they used to organise the functions that went on there. So it was just like a social club. Um, and have you done any research that covers the Chinese scene in Junior? I have, and that's one of the reasons that the exhibition is downstairs, is that I started the research uh, in 2000, 2002, and from there on, I've continued to the point where now we hope to try and get a publisher for a book. Um, we have covered our research in the Maritime Museum of Liverpool, the Liverpool Picton Library, we've been to Kew in London, we've also been to the Shanghai Municipal Archives, we've been to Australia because a similar situation took place there, and we've also covered Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, we things took place the same, uh, plus the Warwick Union Archives at Warwick University. So we've mined out as far as we possibly can, and I try to keep in touch and update if there's any more information regarding the forced repatriation, and I haven't found anything too much at the moment. So we've mined out as far as we can mine out on that. Is there any chance you could give like a general overview of the union as it was? Like of the union? The union, the Siemens Union, um, it was quite active, um, but the gain, the, 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 if you like, the European one, or the UK Union, British Union, and then there was a two, two Chinese unions. There was one which was the Nationalist Union, and mostly the Cantonese were part of that, and then there was a either you can call it a socialist or communist union, and mostly the Shanghai men and the men from Ningbo were in that union. And that moved at one point, lock, stock and barrel, to, to Hong Kong, towards the end of the war. And they were active in trying to look after the men. Did the, um, did the union move at the same time as the repatriation? Mm, no, I think we'd have to, if you want dates, Ask Charles to lick his brains on that. Um, but no, it didn't. Uh, we have the papers at home, but no, it didn't. Um, and so there were two unions that were operating? Two Chinese unions? Two. Yes, and one English union. Um, and they both operated in Liverpool? Yes. Um, so how did, how, was that, I mean, how, did that, how did that work in practice? In terms of well, the Chinese history, the Nationalist and the Nationalist yeah. Party, and the Communist and the Communist Party, yeah. the Socialist Party. So the two unions, two fractions, two, two setups. Um, most of the Cantonese, not all, but most of the Cantonese were national supporters. And so therefore they were part of that union. And then the Shanghai men, hoping for a better future. And the men from Ningbo and northern China were mostly in the socialist union. So you tended to get that divide in Liverpool? Um, for the union, as far as I can gather, yes, yes. But in terms of the, the people, uh, you have to realise as well that they didn't speak the same language. So in Nelson Street, you have one man going to a place called the, the Nork, getting their pension pay from the ship, and one of them going on the opposite side of the street getting theirs, because you have the people that didn't speak the common language. The common language became English. And do you know of any impact that the unions would have had on working conditions? Um, well, yes, they tried to and were to get the war bonus payment of £10, which all the British seamen got. And that was because it, they were fighting a war, they were suffering, and so were the Chinese workers. 
so they f went on strike to get that, eventually got it. Um, the actual pay was different, yes it was lower, but you have to take into consideration where they were employed, they were employed from China, the idea was they'd be going back to China, so their rate of pay was slightly lower, but they had other things that were included which they didn't have for the British team. Was there ever any response from the unions regarding the repatriation? No, not that we're aware of. None at all. And um, what information have you collected about those affected uh, with the repatriation? Quite a lot, actually, <laughs> rather than more than to go into at the moment. Basically, they seem to have targeted the members of the non-nationalist union. So they've mostly targeted the men from Shanghai, Ningbo, the northerners, who they considered as the troublemakers and they wished to get rid of them. So you think that um, more than anything was a deliberate... Yes. ...idea to go after them? Yes, yes, yes. And so how did that change uh, the Chinese that were in Liverpool from there? Well, there was a lot of people. There was a lot of a lot of the men um, still around, but they were again mostly mostly um, Cantonese. There were a few Shanghai gentlemen left. Some of them were already away on ship, working elsewhere. Um, so yes, the change happened on the basis that most of us were left without our fathers, and the number was quite substantial. There was one meeting held in August. Um, I'm not sure of the date now. Yeah. We'd have to confirm that. Um, which was recorded in the Liverpool Echo, and I think we've mentioned that on the website. And that was about 300, I think 350 people. And they asked what had happened and why it had happened and where they got to get the answers. And from what we gather, they didn't. Um, but working out that some of them had anything up to five children, and six and five three, five, six children, and they've been in relationships a long time. We guesstimated there must be about a thousand of us around. So, a thousand, uh, a thousand children. Duration children, yeah. 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 So, um, of the 300 you were repatriated, what, what? No, we don't, no, I didn't say okay. the 300 repatriated, I said there was 350 women that attended a meeting in August okay. to ask what had happened to their husbands. Yeah. Um, but do you have any idea of the number? percentage um, that that would have meant the, the po local population decreased by? No, I don't do percentages and things. <laughs> we can bring Charles in and ask him those sort of questions if you want further details on it. Um, a lot of the information is out there on the site. The fact that um, what was it? There was about, as I said, we guessed about a thousand of children from that period. Um, and they started entering schools, but we don't know how many and we don't know where they went because, again, a lot of the women came into this city to work for the war effort. So they worked in the ammunition factories, they worked elsewhere, and some of them went back either with the children or gave the children up. So we don't know figures. But was it quite significant? Only what I've told you in figures, I can't give you any stats on that. Um, do you know any individual stories from the repatriation of those who you might have later been able to make contact with? Nobody's been able to make contact with anybody. Um, none of us have any documentation. The men used to have to carry a lot of their documentation with them for when they were going on ships. Um, it was a standard procedure because if a ship came up and they needed people, they would just go around and say, you want, you're ready for work, and that was it. So they would go and they'd have to take their papers with them. We have heard a couple of stories. Well, I mean, I, from my own personal point, um, I say my mother was in Hull with me when she, um, they had a small house, and then what happened with her is that at one point her house was burgled, and all my father's papers were stolen but what was left was money and jewellery. Now we also had a story and this is what we've been informed, we haven't been able to prove it, but one of the gentlemen who was forced to leave 
his wife was working for the company and special branch turned up at her work and asked her to go back to the house to collect all his papers. So that was a case which, as I say, I haven't been able to prove it or follow down that track because I haven't particularly investigated it. There's quite the, there's, I mean, this, um, having spoken with someone from local council, it seems that it came more from central, got this kind of situation. Local of council, well, again, it was, it varies. I mean, I know the shipping line wanted to, to get rid of what they considered the troublemakers. I mean, they were having a bad time after the war, steamship was going out of fashion, etc., and labour force. Um, local authorities wanted the housing. So, you know, to revamp the area. There's a whole mix of things. You have to remember it was a war period. Things happened. It was a product of its time. It wasn't a nice thing to happen. But others were treated just as bad. You had a lot of Indians who were very badly treated and were on extremely low pay. A lot of the Chinese were organised. You know, they had societies, they've always had societies. So they were quite well organised, their unions were quite well organised, so communication amongst them was a lot faster. Um, I'm just going branching off a little bit, can you talk a little about what those societies would have been? Oh, well, no, I know there's the likes of, that still exist today, the Sayyib Society and others, but if you read through any Chinese history, they've always had support groups, no matter where they go. They've always had support groups. And it was no different here from what I gather. You know, I mean, there's the Masonic Society and places like that. There was always somewhere to go, you know, I know somebody who knows somebody, so calling on them. So as far as I know, yeah, so I can't tell you on that. And um, what kind of, I'm not sure you can say from a personal level, but what kind of impact did the repatriations have on the families that were living there? Yeah. Quite tragic in some cases. I mean, there were... There's one family I knew who um, her mother seriously considered suicide because um, she was left with children. But then when it came to it, she suddenly thought, if I die, my kids will be put in an orphanage. There'll be nobody to look after them. Uh, one of our, most of our mothers died quite young, when I say young, in their 50s, because they'd had hard lives. Those, I mean, my, my family situation was better than a lot of people I know. Um, but there were one of my group was put into an orphanage and then claimed back again when he was eight. Uh, but for the rest of his life, wouldn't ask questions about it because the response would be, "Don't ask questions, otherwise I'll send you back." Type of thing. There was others that were put into orphanages and didn't come out till they were sixteen at the normal time. Um, there were families whereby their children were given up, um, families that uh, struggled greatly. One of our friends, her mother worked three and four jobs, and today she'd be told off for leaving the kids at home on their own, but she didn't have any choice. So yes, for a lot of them, it was, it was pretty dire. Um, has there ever been any uh, perhaps thought about these people in any way getting some kind of uh, compensation? No, no. Um, that's certainly for the people that I associate with, that's never been our remit. Our major thing was be to find out the truth as far as we could, to also know why, wherefore, if possible. We would like to find out if there's anywhere where the, the names of the men that went back. There's also supposed to have been 20 families that did go back, but we've not been able to find the names. Um, that would be useful to know. I mean, and it would be useful to know for, for every one of us, because nobody has any documentation. I mean, as I say, we are sure that some of them did go back by choice, not knew, really knowing what was going to take place. We are aware that some of them did suffer greatly when they went back, the poverty, no work from the Shanghai archives, you know, so pretty dark both ends but into, I have been somebody has been in touch with me from Shanghai who's been trying to trace their family here which is wonderful uh, but it, not easy not an easy task um, but uh, yeah it's 
you know, it's quite complicated. It's, com it's complex in that not having any written form of names, and a lot of us don't really know our Chinese family names because, again, interpretation, misinterpretation, being put down phonetically or non. So, yeah, quite a complicated thing. But, yeah. sorry, go. Um, I mean, I understand that there's a lot of complexity in never really establishing the truth, uh, but what do you think the impact would be were some greater level of understanding to come out of it? It depends on what level of understanding you're... I mean, already there's a, there's a reasonably clear picture, but I mean, to a great... I mean, obviously one of the perhaps aims you might have is to get more and more of an idea. And that's, that, that's great. We would like... Ideally for us, um, obviously, is to publish the book so that more people know about it. Doing the likes of this interview is so that more people will know about the story. Each time I do something like this, I get more hits on the website. I find that the third generation are very curious about what's happening, and that, I find, is, is, is nice. As I said, I've been lucky enough to put some people in touch with each other, and sort of something rings a bell when somebody tells me something, and I think, ooh, I can try it. But I don't really have the funding. I mean, we've funded all the research ourselves. I don't have that funding, and also the ability, and now, as time's getting on, the time to actually try and trace families. I, that's not my thing at all. What I've set out is to put the story out there to make sure as many people as possible know, in the hopes it doesn't happen again, but you can never tell with anything. Um, so it's quite encouraging that the third generation... Yes, it is. It is. And I think it's important that we can pass on this information, because at some point or other we all sort of think, well, I wonder what is, what's my personality? I mean, I'll say one thing. I didn't set out to find my father. But in doing the research, I have, I found him in myself, in my personality, in my responses to things. It's not my mother's and my mum's side or my dad's side. So I have found him within me. And that's been really very, very good, very useful, and very supportive for me. But without, say, Charles, my husband, I couldn't have achieved anything, what we have done today, because he's the person that's got the background to be able to guide me in my research. And that's, that's how it's, we've managed to do what we have. Um, how, how has your husband been able to help you? What's his background? Sorry? How has your husband been able to help you? Well, Charles' background is his, he, he's an economist, trained economist, and he's got a master's degree in business management. So his academic is background is quite solid f to be able to guide me in that way but also we, we've lived in, and his hobby has always been Chinese history and then having lived in Hong Kong and worked in Hong Kong we've had that extra dimension to be able to find out information and we've had very good friends there who've done translation for us etc etc so we've been very lucky in that way but um, as I said you know I wouldn't have known what an academic search was so Charles said yeah, you do it this way it's been great yeah. And he's got a better memory than I have on facts and figures. <laughs> um, and what can you tell us about the memorial that was established? Well, the memorial plaque is, is put up at the pierhead. We, we wanted something there, and we wanted recognition to be given to the Chinese seamen, that a lot of them had given their lives to the country in the war effort. And we felt some, some recognition should be put there. So we got the plaque. We had to squabble over the words. We were happy to, we felt it should have been that they were repatriated. So we said forced to leave was a more acceptable term, but that actually creates, which is quite good, it creates why was somebody forced to leave? So that's turned out to be positive. Um, we had the words checked to see if it was acceptable. We had the script checked. Originally, one of my contacts who lives in America who's researching. She is actually from London, so she and I have been in touch for quite some time, and she, she reads and writes Chinese, so she did this beautiful interpretation. But the um, consul at the time in Manchester, when he read it, one term was used because we felt they should be classed as their wives, 
and his view was, well, partner, he said, if I call my wife partner, she wouldn't be very happy, so she's my wife. And we said, well, yeah, we prefer that term to be used, because that's what they were considered as. So we had that changed, and when it was completed, we got the approval, the OK, and we were asked, who do you want to see this? And we said, well, we want the younger generation of Chinese in particular to be able to read it if they come here. So that's how the wording is there. And every year we come and lay a wreath at the time to, to, to honour the fact that they're there. So the memory's there. The, 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 the memorial plaque is in English and Mandarin. Yes, yes, yes. That was we, quite deliberate. Yes, very deliberate. Yes, very deliberate. Basically because this is a seaport. We've been twinned with Shanghai for years. We have lots of Chinese relationships and we felt it was appropriate that it should be in both languages. Ideally, we would love to put one up in Shanghai. But as I say, we self-funded it, so we couldn't do that. We wanted something put up in Chinatown, but we couldn't afford that. Um, we didn't really get a lot of support from council to do that. They gave us the support to go ahead and put this up, which was great, and we were very pleased with that. They've since put an acknowledgement up in the city, but that was done by, I think, Moira Kenny and her group have done a great job. They've got an acknowledgement of the blue funnels at the north. But, you know, it's all small steps. How are you able to uh, self-fund it? We worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> we worked hard and we saved, it. and that's it. We've done it. We wanted to. The plaque was my 60th birthday from my husband, so it was rather nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's just it's created an interest. It's been like a big um, jigsaw puzzle, and it's also been like a mystery. So we wanted to solve the problems, and that's how we've done it. And it's kept us both occupied, stimulated mentally. It's nice to have some. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is good to have that physical acknowledgement because it is important. I mean, you can do all this, and if people don't pick up a book and read or anything, or they're just going around as a tourist, it, it creates an interest. And since we put the plaque up there, other groups have been given permission to do the same, which is lovely. So you've now got acknowledgement to other nationalities that served in the wars, which is important. We owe to a lot of people. It's creating a snowball effect. Yes, a bit. Yes, yes, it does seem to have done, which I think is wonderful. Mm. Um, can, you, can you tell me about the role that Half and Half is, plays in the local Chinese community? It hasn't. It hasn't because it doesn't exist there. It's on my website. That's the name we gave it. Um, and just our small group, and that's all it is. It's my and my husband's creation. And we put the website up and called it half and half and to see what would happen. And as I said, fortunately, we get a lot of interest. We get a lot of stories. Um, and as I say, we have been lucky enough to put people in touch with each other. I mean, we've got some photographs on there in case anybody recognises them. We've actually got a Chinese section on there, which we had a lot of glitches with. We hope it's clear enough, but because I don't read Chinese. Um, and, but other friends have and said it's acceptable. So... We've had responses, which is important. So it's another way of getting the story there. Um, so you don't really have any contact with the, the, the community centres or organisations? No, not really, because I haven't lived in the country. I haven't lived in, I haven't lived in the city for years. I think I left, I left Merseyside in about 71. And we've moved around ever since in different parts of the country and then moved internationally. So, no, I haven't been part of it. I've always been aware of it because my family are here and my husband's family are here. And we you know, regularly visit the family and contact. But no, I've not been part of the society. And I've made no bones about that. I haven't. And I'll encourage that things are happening. Well, there's lots of events going on. I mean, you've got... There are you know, we've got the community centres, which is important. We've got healthcare. We've got recognition that there is a Chinatown there at the present time, and there's other people doing work alongside the community. Uh, I think Maudie Kenny is recording some of the histories. She's recorded a lot of the histories of some of the Chinese seamen that came in in '48, and she's gathering their stories, which is terrific. So, yeah. And what would you say the future aims of uh, your group is? Um, well, I think all of us would be 
thrilled if somebody found a relative. Um, we don't think it's going to happen. We're all in our late 60s. Um, so, you know, no great hope on that score. But I think, I think we're all quite happy with what's taken place, the fact that the word is out there. Um, and, yes, they're very encouraging. So whenever I say I'm going to do something or try to persuade them, they say, oh, no, you do it. <laughs> but they're all encouraging. So that's the main thing. So you tend to say to leave? Yes, mainly because they won't do it. <laughs> they won't do it, they're all too shy and whatever. But it's also, they, we're the ones that have done the research, so they figure we've got more of the knowledge than they have. But, you know, they've got it in the way that they can accept it, and they, they, they're quite happy with it. So if I suggest that I might do this, or I say, what do you think, would you like to come along, should I, shouldn't I, they say, yeah, go on, go, you know. Um, but they won't necessarily take part. They say they're interviewed out, so I can understand it, because they have done a lot yeah, for different groups. Um, I have a few questions. No, as far as I know, it's Jung. That's the family name. And my mother's view was she could easily spell that. Y-O-U-N-G was her response. Um, and from what I was told, which is, again, limited, because at the time that we grew up, you didn't ask questions. Um, and we were all sort of skeletons in the cupboard in the most part. Um, from what I know, he lived um, on the, in the French quarters. Or, 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 as he said, the bordering of the French and English quarters of Shanghai. Um, he had, I think it was a couple of brothers and a couple of sisters. And he was here, he was at Liverpool, trained to be an engineer, because Liverpool universities had a long association with Shanghai, and uh, a lot of sort of engineering students in particular. So that's where he was training. and. Um, my mother was working in the canteen at the time, that's how they met. So, do you have a Chinese name for us? No, no, no. Because I, as I, my father, my father, from what I was born in the February, and I believe that my father had gone on ship um, in the March, and then he didn't appear again. So, I don't have, I, when I say I don't have a Chinese name, my name Yvonne was given to me by my Shanghai father because it was a French name and its meaning is yew tree, and the association appealed to him with the name Young. So I did get my name actually from him. So actually, Chinese your Chinese name is Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, did your mother mention to you anything about your father's? Maybe like he was tall. My mother was, my mother was about 5'10", so she was quite tall for a lady at that time. And my father, I believe, was over six foot tall. And uh, so we were a couple of his friends, and one of my other group, his father was about six foot. And um, he played a musical instrument, which the name of, I've forgotten, is um, Yangtze. Yangtze, yeah. And uh, he played that. So I do know that much. And um, yeah, he wanted to change the world. He was very very concerned about being fair and trying to assist other people. So, yeah. so how was your mother to deal with the situation after your father disappeared? It was very difficult for her. Yeah, she had to leave. She left Hull and came back to Liverpool, but she didn't live with her father and mother because she'd been disowned originally by her father. She went to live with her grandmother and then eventually her mother insisted that she go back to live at home, which she did because I was the first grandchild. So, so at that period, uh, any relative or friends that shot out your family? My, grand, my, my mother's mother did. My great grandmother supported her, and so did my aunts, a couple of my aunties. But it took a long time for my grandparents to accept me. Um, they felt my mother should get me adopted because she could have another life, but fortunately my mother didn't, or might, some might say it's not fortunate, but 
So she didn't. So she, yeah, she, she kept me, and then she married, and we, I have a sister. Yeah. So how was you when uh, this incident happened? Sorry. How was you when uh, your father disappeared? I was a baby. Yeah. yeah. I was a baby. Yeah. So uh, there's no memory of that? No, I have no memory whatsoever. The only person I know is my dad, is my dad, my stepdad. But I'd never, ever, he's my dad. And I never searched or wanted to search for my father because, like, most of our mothers believed that our fathers had deserted us and so they believed their husbands had deserted them. And therefore, a lot of the attitude of the my group and particularly the men well if he left us why should I bother you know he didn't want to know me and I, this is fairly common um, and I suppose my thing I had a fabulous dad I had a good mother I had a sister it wasn't an issue for me so do you have a photo of your Shanghai father? no sadly no no none of us have. there's there's only two two of my group that have a photograph of their fathers and both those photographs are on the website and we're all envious of them because nobody else has got anything. One's even got a letter, which we just, you know, think is absolutely wonderful, and we're happy for them. But oh, and I tell, sorry, I tell a lie. There's three of them, um, and that's one, one of my friend in Canada. She, his photographs on the website, the wedding photograph. He's on there, John. Um, so yes, there's three of them that have photographs of their fathers, but that's it. She's my sister. That's it. Yes. Yeah, sis, period. Yeah, she's just my sister. I say I've been very lucky compared to a lot of my friends, a lot of our group. I had a very loving family, a very caring family. Yet we all had our troubles, as, as everybody does, and we all suffered some poverty, etc., etc. But as a family of loving and care, no, I was I was very lucky in that respect. So there was no concern really. And my sister has been extremely supportive for what we've been doing and finding out. Yeah, so, yeah. I was wondering, uh, at the time it happened, how much, were, you said there was a meeting about where 350 women attended? I believe so, yeah, that was in the August of, I think, I think it might have been August 42 or 43. So at the time, oh. how much awareness of there was that no. they had? From what we gather, none. None of their questions were answered. We found nothing in the newspaper. And in fact, as I said, and the, the, the consul said, it's a piece of history that we know nothing about, i.e. the Chinese. And it was a little piece of history that nobody knew about here. We're just a glitch in a period of time that's taken place. So even at the time, it was a very quiet, done yes, yes, operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was very, like, um, I'm just wondering, obviously if, if everybody's affected individually by it, you can believe that it has well, there were a very small number, yeah. and in the archives, it, it, I forget the statement, it's something to the effect of, the, of no importance. So we were the first to look at the file in 60 years, because we were a very small number. And you've got to look at the time that it took place after the Second World War. You have a city that's practically wiped out, particularly in all the dock area, because this city was heavily bombed. You've got men returning from warfare, they're looking for accommodation, they're looking for work. So you only have this small pocket of Chinese. And they don't create. You know, even to this day you you don't create a problem. And they're too small in number, so you don't get involved politically or anything else. You have no plan. Yes, well, it wasn't, it wasn't enforced or it wasn't reinforced by my mother. Um, we didn't talk about it. And most of our group didn't talk about it um, because we're of a period where children are to be seen and not heard and you don't, get, you don't ask questions. You, so we didn't. And we've all said we don't know why, but we didn't. You know, it's just one of those things. Um, so, yeah, we were just... My mother didn't say she 
hated him, didn't think about it, but she obviously thought about him. There was things that she did in her life, which was a bit of a surprise to me. You know, like she used to drink hot water, but I can't stand hot water. And I didn't know why, I just thought, well, that's a bit odd. But when I went to live in Hong Kong, all my friends drank hot water. And I suddenly thought, oh. <laughs> So, you know, all those obviously little things st still were around. So, and it, so I th my mother had been going out with him for a couple of years, so you know, it was quite nice to know. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't grow up disliking him or anything else because I didn't know that person. I'm very, sort of, very down to earth. And I didn't, I never considered that I would search for him because I had too much respect for my dad and for my mother. She didn't want to tell me anything, and that was her choice, and I was quite happy. So it was after my mother died, and then my father died a year later, and then this story came out that I'd heard, and I thought, right, OK, I'll start looking. I wished I had done earlier, especially when I was in Hong Kong, because a lot of the seamen, particularly the Shanghai seamen, settled in Hong Kong, those that could. And I might have had who knows what stories to tell or what relationships to marry up with people, just don't know, but it wasn't to be, so, yeah. So, once you find out uh, the true story behind this, uh, is there any psychological change about your, uh, say, your thought on the... Your... No, I just, yeah, I used to wonder, you know, you sort of think different, I don't think as somebody else did, say, within the family or whatever, and just wonder about things. So as I said, I didn't set out to find him, but I did find him in myself. My attitudes, my responses, my behaviour is different, so therefore the only other person it can come from is my father. That's it. So do you find comfort from finding the truth? I find it's been very positive in that I used to think, why do I question this, why do I question that? Um, and yeah, it's sort of, I thought, oh, yeah, okay. Well, that is obviously my genetic side. You know, we inherit everything else your colour, your skin, so on and so forth. So, why not your attitude and your brains or whatever, what brains they've got? Yeah. But we have the same feeling of one of your other group members. Oh, yes, we all, we all, one of my friends who was lucky enough to go to Shanghai. We were all going to go as a group, but we couldn't for one reason or another. And he went with his wife, and he came back and he said, I actually recognise my Chinese side more than I've ever done before. So, that, you know, that's been positive. Um, and a number of others have said the same thing. So it's acknowledging that it's there. At the same time, there's been others that said, no, you're opening doors, I don't want to go in. You know, so... It's, yeah, everyone has a, a, a mixed response to what's taking place and if they found out. But it has brought a lot of comfort and closure to people to recognise that. Um, like one lady said to me who was in her 80s, she said, well, you know, even at my age, it's nice to think that I might not have been deserted. And that, to me, was just the icing on the cake, to know that. And I think... Yeah, you know, for a lot of people, fortunately, it has brought them closure. It's brought it's a term that is used, and I think for some people it has been. And for others, it's it's given them a a sense of identity that they do have that other culture within them, or that other interest and that other part of their person. So the shoe has come out uh, after your mother. So the st no, I didn't know about it. So she didn't know. So she didn't know. No, no, no. She didn't know about what I'd done. But I think she'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. I think she'd be happy with it. And um, and obviously, I think the fact that recognition has been given to those women because they did suffer. Yeah, a lot of them did suffer. I mean, they suffered because a because they had a at that period a mixed race child. Uh, they had difficulty, perhaps, in some of them did, in getting another partner, husband, whatever, and I have that acceptance. So, yeah, a lot of them did so. And so it was kind of nice for us to be able to acknowledge that, you know, they had a role to play and they played it well. So, yeah. It seems like it's quite a, been quite a personal. The reason we've achieved as much as we have is because it is personal. 
but I wanted to know. Stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. I wanted to know, and I felt it very important to know. Yeah. Um, we feel that we have got the story correct as far as we possibly can, and I've always wanted to get the facts. I dislike the fact that there has been different stories out there uh, about men being rounded up. We've got no record whatsoever. The only time that men were rounded up was when they were due to go on ship, and the company used to send a van out to pick them up to go on to their ship. But there's nothing we can find of any horrible roundup. It was a bit more unpleasant, actually. We sort of slowly take them away or give them a one-way ticket, a working ticket at that. Mm. That's all the questions you've got for you, but if you anything else you want to ask. I think I'm a bit dry now. <laughs> Unless you want anything else answered, if you want any facts and figures, grab the man over there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. okay.